So in the early 70s, I'm sort of running around like a headless chicken, trying to work out what the duality of my, this black and British existence actually meant. And then in 1975, I saw Bob Marley in the Lyceum. Changed my life forever. Ever, ever. Ooh, yeah. As him say, until the colour of a man's skin is of no more significance to the colour of his eyes, you know. Will said that. I mean, this man right. From the youngest of ages, I've, I have memories of listening to Bob with my mum in the kitchen, whatever, like, so his words have always been in me and I, I've always taken notice to what he said, so, you know, what's the point sitting there and being quiet? A lot of the vision people have of me is just like the sort of personification of a giant spliff, but it's not really true at all. The true essence of him is this rebel spirit. That means he's your own man. That's the first time you own yourself. You do what you want to do. Anything people want to say about you, you don't care. They were like real sort of rebels, you know. They were they were prepared to to uh, they were they, they they were ready to work where they wanted to do everything pretty much on their own terms, you know. Get up, stand up. My parents came to this country from Jamaica in the 1950s. Well, what people call nowadays the Windrush generation. What they brought was flavour. They brought sunshine, they brought style, and they brought music. You know, my parents had been brought over to help rebuild the country after the Second World War. And unfortunately, they weren't treated too well. That's putting it mildly. They were strangers in a strange land. I mean, London was a complete dump. You know, it was still in the aftermath of World War II. You know, there were, there were bomb sites, you know, next to, you know, the National Gallery. And certainly in the 1960s, there were those signs up saying, you know, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. And what they did to try and assimilate, some of them was to try and anglicize themselves, which, you know, my mob growing up as first generation British born black saw that that was never going to work. My parents were, gonna, were getting screwed. So we had to sort of re-educate ourselves and that really happened through the music that we were listening to. And that was typified by Bob Marley. He and Peter and Bunny came into the office in London and the three of them came in and they were nobodies, but they were like huge stars. Their attitude and the, the vibe they gave Chris Blackwell, who's a white Jamaican, when he gave the money to the whalers to go to Jamaica to make the album. Several people at Island Records told him he was crazy, that he'd never see that money again. Because they had a bad reputation. If you've ever seen The Harder They Come, they were, they were sort of like the Jimmy Cliff character in The Harder They Come, you know, trouble. You looking for me? I come to shoot your Rude Boy described the way of life, an attitude of defiance and rebellion against the system in which the odds are stacked against the poor. The amount was £4,000 they gave him to make this record, which uh, is a minute amount now, and it wasn't that much then. And uh, a few months later, I went down to Jamaica, and I rang them up, and, you know, wondering if I was going to hear anything, if it was going to be anything for me to hear. And they came around, picked me up at the hotel, and played me uh, Catch a Fire. And uh, I know enough about recording to know that 
4,000 pounds was in that record. You know, they put every penny in it. Now, by that time, society had managed to alienate its own white youth. And as Johnny Rotten so eloquently put it, it definitely felt like there was no future. Luckily for me and my black brethren, we had a soundtrack to ease our pain. But my white mates, not so lucky. The popular music of the time was a million miles from the vibe on the streets. You know, they're singing about shit like Hotel California. So my white mates set about creating a soundtrack that was sort of relevant to their situation, sort of of the people, for the people, by the people. Punk rock. It was a part of a time when black children and white children started going to school together, but it, we weren't quite there yet. It was quite challenging. And so there was a tendency really to stick with who you knew and go to the places you knew. The first show that I covered of Bob Marley, there was a sort of an equal number of black and white kids in the audience and the atmosphere was electric. And then fashion started to take over. All of a sudden, kids on the street, black and white, would start wearing red, green and gold hats. And then with it, the language. If you go to the housing estates, certainly around Bridgeton, Clapham area, most white kids, when they talk to you, the slang has got a lot of Jamaican in it. It's a lot of patois. Bob Marley really crossed over in a huge way. And he put Jamaican music on the map. It was the music of Jamaica that was sort of capturing the imagination of the youth on the street. You know, with the launch of labels like Trojan Records, who provided the soundtrack to the UK's first multiracial youth movement, Skinheads. And they were really a mashup of kind of white working class youth that loved the style and the music of the Jamaican Rude Boys. Black and white kids would often go along to the same club, whether it was to listen to punk music, or whether you listen to Star and Blue Beat and Rocksteady music. One wore heavy boots and tight t-shirts and had short hair, and the other had dreadlocks and red, green and gold. So yes, it was a little bit incongruous, but I can kind of understand how it happened. It was about the attitude. We were like-minded rebels. You know, we were both anti-establishment. We both believed in using music as a tool for social change. Automatically, you'd make the similarities between Bob Marley and Joe Strummer. They're both kind of passionate rebel spirits. They're both also not quite what you expect because they're all gentlemen, basically, you know, with a certain humility about them. Last time I saw Bob, we had an argument about punk rock. I'd gone round to Oakley Street in Chelsea. He owed me some money. Surprise, surprise. And I'd gone round there wearing bondage trousers. And I guess Bob had been reading the tabloid press, which had been painting a very negative idea of what punk was about. You know, to them it was all about gobbing and nihilism and all this negativity. 42 Oakley Street is just off the King's Road. And the King's Road was the centre of, of London's, Britain's punks. So he would have seen these people all the time going up and down. And at first he was not very convinced at all. Bob looks at me in my bondage trousers like, done let's, we are deal with you. look like one of them nasty blood club. And I took offense to this. I'm like, Bob, hold on a second. You know, you're talking about people that are my friends. You know, they're not crazy ball heads. They're like-minded rebels. And there's something going on there. Check it out. And he's like, Shall we are tough? He said like, yeah, right. And basically told me to bugger off. And I left with my tail between my legs. And Bob Marley goes to see The Clash, 1977 at the Rainbow, which stands in the wings. And then he kind of gets it. Three months later, a somewhat better informed Bob wrote the song, Punky Reggae Party. presence in London really became part of the fusion of hunk and reggae. It was a very important symbolic presence at that time. Society has become more multicultural. Bob Marley was a very important part of that. It's a testament really to the power of culture to unite the people and help us to integrate and make this place a more interesting country, you know. Without, I mean, I think the Afro-Caribbean 
Input has changed the idea of what it means to be British. One love, hear the children crying. One heart, saying give thanks and praise to the Lord, and I will feel alright. You know, between you know Bob's inspiration and the whole punk rock thing, that I became a filmmaker. In fact, got to make the video for his um, One Love video. Well, making the One Love video was obviously difficult, but it was after Bob Marley had passed away, so we had to come up with an idea that captured the spirit and. Uh, to be honest with you, I think it was a guy, the guy that was running Ireland at the time, Dave Robinson, who suggest, suggested that we get some celebrities in. And uh, we went for it, man. Well, I remember going to Lion Hill Carnival and hearing Bob's music being played. And you know, Carnival started as a celebration of black culture and black communities. I mean, the Carnival was actually formed in the late 50s as a response to kind of the racial tensions that were happening back then. I think Bob was really surprised by how much impact Jamaican music had made when he went to the carnival. Because, you know, by, in those days, we're talking hundreds of sound systems, not like today we've got 40. And it was really two days where, you know, those streets were ours, man. Yeah, well, it's an expression of black culture. It's never been a thing that's been aggressive. It's always been a thing that's welcoming. Come experience it. Let's share, eat food, let's dance. It's great energy addictive energy, dangerous energy with rum. It's a moment when you start going down Labrook Grove and the music is echoing off the street and you really feel for that moment that you own London. So it was really empowering, it was hugely enjoyable and it brought all West Indians together. It's almost like a direct representation of London completely and entirely, but in two or three days. And it's something that I personally care a lot about. And I know most people involved in London care about. And it's amazing that we still manage to have that. Obviously, powers that be and whatnot have tried to shut it down so many times, but they don't, how can you shut something down with such mass importance, which brings so many different people together? It's amazing. We should be proud of it. Set the captives free. The first time I saw him live was the famous Lyceum gig. People still talk about that concert today. It has to be the most famous Bob Marley concert. Because I walked out of that gig a changed man, empowered, inspired, inspired, inspired. I think the thing that really struck me, you know, when he was on stage, is here was a man that was doing things on his own, on his own terms. He wasn't anglicising himself, he wasn't straightening his hair like the black Americans. It was about who he was and where he was coming from. It seemed to me that you can only really go forward once you knew that. The Lyceum gig, No Woman No Cry, is on that album. But then it's out, there's a single, a live single. Because you'd hear it on the radio, the guy needed, hadn't heard any other live tracks on the radio before, on Radio 1, for example, and that just comes up and it's quite rapturous. Also, the point about No Woman No Cry, kind of harking back really to Johnny Nash, it's not a kind of traditional reggae song at all. No Woman No Cry. No woman.
cello of all instruments is, is very, very close to the sound of the human voice. When it's playing a song, you can really hear singing even though there are no words that come with it. When I'm practicing the cello, I do a lot of improvisation and kind of playing around with tunes that are in my head. And this No Woman No Cry was one of those tunes that was going around in my head. It has such a beautiful melody and I think beautiful in, in its simplicity. No genre is exclusive to that genre. Whilst I've mainly been drawn to classical music, I've been massively influenced by Bob Marley and other artists as well. Whenever I put reggae on, it's like big people time. That's what I call it. And of course, there's a lot of younger reggae artists that are flying the flag. Also part of where I made Daughter of Arasta, the name, it's like I am a daughter of Arasta, but also it's kind of signifies the generational gap. It's like I'm the daughter of reggae and Rasta, I'm a daughter from that. And now my generation, our generation is dancehall. Yeah, my, but reggae has been the driving force of probably like most subcultures, most musical subcultures in London from the 60s, 70s. Since it come to there, since the Skinners, it's been, it's been, you know, the driving force of most music. They're off beat syncopations, everything, you know, drum and bass. And reggae just lets me know I can sing about whatever I want to sing about, whether I'm happy, sad, joyful, gleeful, whatever you know, pull it out there. Struggling, pull it out there. I'm joyful for reggae because it's just taught me to voice whatever's on your mind. There are no fairy tales in East London. Oi, yo, fairy tales inside a dungeon. Oi, all of the lyrics tales under the trunchon. Babylon, when in the stand, all of a sudden, Babylon, when in the stand, all of a sudden, to be a young man. Sin out using the fruits of Babylon, so to speak. Be a young man. Any kind of organization. The fruits of Babylon. Babylon. Well, yeah. If you probably was in that, like, the growth that we've done, you know, as I was talking about, through all that m malarkey, all that, all the NF stuff. When I was a kid, my mum used to warn me about NF, but you know, like when I was young, luckily I didn't really see all that stuff, do you know? And then, um, as I grew up in London, the, it's the most wonderful, harmonious feel ever. And that's why I love it so much, with me and my mates, and that's what we do. We've always had it from young, we've been living with each other since we was like 15, 16, all races, doesn't matter. But, you know, to see all this stuff, make us uh, uh, re-emerge so publicly everywhere around the world, like even in London, shambles. And the powers that be should be ashamed. And the people's and the, little, and the vermin that crawl out of their cracks should go back to whatever bridge they crawled under. Because it's 2020 and it's prehistoric, it's dinosaur behaviour. It should be, it'd be ashamed. My biggest achievement was even just to walk into as part as an MP at all. No one expected it, but quite some time afterwards, you know, people you could, people would look at me as if, you know, what is this black girl doing here? So in a way, finding my way into the Houses of Parliament, the heart, if you like, of the old British Empire. I speak to all the children. I speak to everything that move it and live it on the earth. All of my family are music. Get up, stand up, stand up.
It's interesting in the 21st century that the side of Bob that's being pushed is the kind of love, spiritual, conscious thing, which we all need, don't get me wrong. But I don't think that it should be the expense of the ragamuffin, rude boy, rebel, because we need that too. Just look at what's going on.